You know, the harvest is right and the labourers are few. And I wanna call to action any labourers here tonight because I believe that there's literally ripe fruit right near you and I. You know, my, my neighbours, or thank goodness for my evangelistic wife, you know, because basically I think six of our street are at City Point in some way or form because she's an amazing woman of God. But there's neighbours on the other side of my house that it's not my wife's call to reach, it's not someone else's call to reach, they're in my street. I've been called to reach them. There's people in your world, don't pray to God, God, get them, save them. No, no, you save them. Well, hear me, that's doctrinally could get a bit weird, but you invite them for beginning to into the house of God and watch what God can do. Because Pastor Mark says this amazing scripture and it stirs me every time. His desire, right, is that not one shall perish. Not one. So let's not wait for other people to do all the hard work. Why don't we just respond to the Holy Spirit inside of us and say, who could I invite in these next four days? Are you urgent for the lost? Does your heart long and crave for the lost to be found just like you and I have been found? Our passage tonight from Romans chapter one, we're gonna read. Verses 16, this is Paul writing to the church of Rome. It was 57 AD, which is about 20 to 25 years after Jesus had died, risen again and ascended to heaven. And it says, for I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ, for it is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile, meaning all men. This good news tells us how God makes us right in His sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the Scripture says, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. Now I love this, for I am not ashamed of the good news. Is anyone else here tonight not ashamed of the Gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ? For it is the power unto salvation. I wanna speak to you tonight if you are gonna take notes. I don't have three points, but I do have a title. How clever am I? Living unashamed. Everybody say, living unashamed. The definition of being unashamed, to express openly without guilt or embarrassment. You know, one of the things I believe is the enemy's tactic against the church, against you and I, to stop us if he can, to try limit our ability to live out this Scripture for I'm not ashamed, is fear of man's opinion. And I wanna speak to some people tonight. Let your love for God be greater than your fear for men. Value God's opinion beyond man's opinion. Live with a healthy fear for God that demolishes a fear of man. You know, their opinion of you, young man, young woman, friend tonight, is temporal. Their opinion of you and what you believe in and the God you serve is only a temporal opinion. But our God's opinion is eternal. Our God is our firm foundation and who we live by, who we walk out of. You know, we live in crazy times right now. The political climate's crazy. People don't even know what they can or cannot say. I can't even define my son as a boy publicly for being scrutinised for self-identifying without letting my four-year-old identify his own gender, right? We have the family unit, just crazy value system, crazy. Uh, can anyone sense what's happening and it has been happening for probably the last couple of years now? We live in crazy times where I believe the enemy is trying to silence the church. And that the church, and hear my heart, I'm not saying let's get loud and let's get vocal and be known for what we're against. No, 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 let's be known for love. Let's be known for what Jesus is known for. Things that we're for versus things we're against. But when you're sitting in your lecture hall and you're being potentially aware that you could be called a bigot or assumed of things in your value system because of your faith, then we live in a time where I believe like never before has the church tried to be silenced by society. I think about even recently, um, I'm not gonna go into it, but Israel Folau, right? This, even this last weekend, I'm not gonna talk about his um, approach, whether it was the right tactic or way to do it. But I commend a man that is not ashamed of his belief. And um, whether the way he outdid that is, that's not what tonight's even about. But imagine if there are other people like you and I or people of great influence that also were not ashamed of their belief. And that when something was to be risen, that whether some people think um, is justified or not, imagine if there was sport teams filled with believers that would say, no, no, I'm also uh, like pro-life. No, I also have faith in Jesus Christ. And I want us to, I wanna stir you and I tonight that we wouldn't be silenced when we're asked of our opinion. Because I believe there's people, sometimes you're almost camouflaged within your lecture hall or you're camouflaged, you almost wanna just retract in your workplace. And I'm not saying let's be loud and vocal, but let's not be ashamed 
of the Gospel. When asked, what do you believe? Are we the people, the remnant of Jesus Christ on earth? We're the only ones to represent Him that's left in society. Are we able to stand firm and say, I'm not ashamed of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the good news and the power unto salvation. If we, the church, will not rise up, who will? If we, the church, will not have an alternate opinion, who will? We've been called to live unashamed. You know, I think about the Last Supper um, and Jesus obviously tells Peter that he's gonna deny him three times. Peter's like, that's crazy, I would not. Next minute, you know, we read in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, there's Peter and uh, he unfortunately denies Jesus to people that approach him three times, the rooster crows. Why did Peter do that? Because of fear of man's opinion, a fear of an association with God. And for you and I today in modern society, would we allow this ridiculous thing called fear of others dictate our livelihood to society? How do we remove fear of man? I'm glad you asked tonight. Let's turn to Romans 12. And so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because all He has done for you. Let them be a loving, a living sacrifice, the kind where He finds acceptable. This is truly the way to worship Him. Don't copy the behaviours and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. In other versions it says, renewing of your mind. Then you will learn to know God's will for your life, which is good and pleasing and perfect. You know, I believe the renewing of our mind, it's, it's twofold. It takes a combination of two things. One, living in the presence of God. And secondly, reading the Word of God. Now, let me explain this a little bit if I can. I love the presence of God. If I was given like one book to write my whole life on any topic, it would be about the presence of God and how it can actually transform your life. And there's no other company greater than the company of Christ, being in the presence. But you know what? To just live in the presence of God with avoidance to the Word of God makes it null and void. Because even Satan himself, Lucifer, was in the presence of God yet he left God. Judas was in the presence of Jesus, yet he betrayed Jesus. You know, we just talked about Peter was in the presence of Jesus, yet he denied Jesus three times. Living in the presence of God is no longer sufficient for our lives, amen, church? But if we need to renew our minds in order for us to not live a life of fear, but a life that's unashamed, we need to have a combination of these two things. Do we live in the presence of God? It's not a place that we visit, it's a place that we dwell. It's a place that we habitat where we live. That when we wake up, Lord God, as I'm brushing my teeth and this looks not super like, you know, great, um, hey, but you know the awkward sides of me. When you're waking up and you're getting rid of sleep in your eyes, hey, Father God, I'm in your presence. What an honour it is to be in your company. In your presence, there's fullness of joy today. I receive your fruits of the Spirit. I receive your joy because you dwell here. But that combined with the Word of God, all of a sudden, Christians have a renewing of our mind on a daily basis where we no longer are dictated by the culture of society and the ways of society that Paul speaks about in Romans, but we're dictated by the words of God. You know, a true encounter, when people talk about the presence of God and have ever had that person like, oh, I had an encounter. And you're like, what does it look like? You know, because ever, ever noticed like encounters are really different for different people. For some people an encounter, like you gotta be on the floor. Like if you're not spot on the floor, like mm, not sure if that was an encounter, you know. If for some people it's like, if you're not a mess, like you're not have snot, you're like, oh, you know, question your encounter, you know. But for all of us, this is what I would define as an encounter in the presence of God. True encounters with God are revelatory and transformative. They're always based around a revelation of who God is, not just what He can do for you. I'll say it again, true encounters with God are always rev revelatory and transformative. You can't encounter the Spirit of God without being transformed. Now let's get a bit creepy if we can for a moment. For every Christian here tonight, we have a ghost dwelling inside of us, the Holy Ghost. Okay, that's pretty out there, right? But if you're a believer, that you would believe this wholeheartedly and unashamedly, that we have a ghost living inside of us, the Holy Ghost. Now you can't have the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead living inside of you, breathing inside of you and not have a passion, right, for what He cares for. You, you have, you know, my dad was speaking about it just this week, we're catching up about, you, you have inside of us, we have inside of us a heaven citizen dwelling here. 
not an Australian citizen, not for those online, an American citizen, wherever. A heaven citizen lives inside our beings now that we have received Christ. So he carries the nature of heaven. He carries the sound of heaven, the accent of heaven. The value system of heaven now dwells inside of you and I, right? Does anyone believe that? You have the Holy Spirit living. So when we have the Spirit of God, the beautiful, unquenchable Spirit of God that cannot be denied of living inside of us, then man, we've got a zeal for the lost. We've got a zeal for every lost brother, son, daughter to come home to their father because there's a piece of that inside you and I. And I wanna stir your heart tonight for an urgency. Have you lost your zeal for the lost? Because my prayer tonight as believers, as saints, as those that carry the presence of God, the very Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, what an amazing gift that we even get to be a carrier and a temple of where He dwells. We have to, have to, have to have a heart for the lost. We can't live complacent, church. We can't live comfortable. Your best life is at the end of your comfortable life. Live your best life where God's called you to reach others. A true encounter is always revelatory and transformative. There we find that all of a sudden, we're no longer fighting against this thing called fear of man when trying to be unashamed. You know, the other thing when I think about the nature of God is the boldness, as bold as a lion inside of you and I tonight. Romans 1 verse 16, let's read it again. says, For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work. You know, what excites me when I read this, when the Word of God comes as a revelation to me, is that it's not my work. It's not your ability. It's not your power. It's the power of God. Let's give Him His credit back where credit to. It's His power, right? Through you and I. It's the good news. I don't know about you, but when I read this, all of a sudden I have this boldness of like, You're a good God, it's your power to save all of humanity. It's not my job, it's not your job. The pressure is not on you to save your family. Give the Holy Ghost His job back. Give Christ His job back. It's His power unto all salvation. And when we have this boldness, all of a sudden we, you know, let's read what boldness is. The definition of boldness is a person, action or idea showing a willingness to take risks, be confident and courageous. You know, when I think about confidence and courageous. I think about coming to God like a child, with childlike faith. And if, if I was to think about what it looks like to be bold, um, I don't know if you can ear muff Noxie for a sec, babe, but um, I'm gonna do something a little bit fun. Is everyone, is everyone up for a bit of an experiment? So everyone knows that any pastor or preacher, if they're ever gonna get a child up, it's well rehearsed. It's like, polish, you practice what they say, you tell them how to pray so they look really Christian when they get up and they make you the pastor look like, what a good dad, oh my goodness, that kid knows the word tabernacle and his prayer, like that's all made up. That's all done behind the scenes before they go on the stage. But tonight, this is completely unrehearsed because when I thought about this and when the Lord was speaking to me about true boldness, to live unashamed, the name that come to mind was my son Knox, which his name, Knox Archibald actually means true and bold. So for this not to be polished and rehearsed, because we're family, right? This is church. Hey, Noxie, do you wanna come up on stage for a sec? Come, yeah, come up if you want. You can come up, Hunter, if you want. Because a child knows when he trusts his father, hey, what's up? You stand here, that's it. When a child trusts his, his father and he knows he can find all assurance in his father, his father's not gonna put him in a situation he can't handle, right? And you and I have a Father that will not put you in situations that you cannot handle. And so there's a boldness you and I are called to. Um, let's have a chat. How are you? Good. Um, so when's Easter? Five days. Five? Seven. Seven. What's in five days? Friday. That's right. Good Friday. Okay. Um, what's Easter mean to you, Hunter? Um that uh, um, um, that He saves us. Great, it's awesome. Good job, mate. What's Easter mean to you, Knox? Mm, for Jesus dying for cross for us. And why do you, why do you reckon He did that? Because He wanted to. That's so good. You know why? So we could save us. Yes. Awesome. Should we pray? Yes. yes. Yeah, okay. Everyone just close your eyes for a moment. 
this bold experiment's going better than I was hoping. I'm really relieved, to be honest. It's like, please God, please God. Hey? Okay, Noxie, let's close our eyes. Let's pray. Do you want to pray about Easter and everyone here today that's going to come to Easter next Sunday? No. What do you want to pray about? You just pray about whatever you want. Uh, okay, close your eyes. Let's pray. I hope that people love Easter, that I really know that pe- some people don't like Easter, but some people do if they want to have Easter eggs when their parents say they're about Amen. That was awesome. Easter eggs. Give it up, everyone, for Hunter and Knox. You can go down if you want. When you come to Christ like a child and you know that your dad is a good dad, all of a sudden you have boldness. You're willing to step into environments you weren't maybe prepared for or told about because our God is good. Your dad is good. And when the Word of God says, we'll read it again together, our passage tonight. For I am not ashamed of this good news about Jesus Christ. It's the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes. Then you can be bold in that very situation. You know, in a moment, the host team are gonna come and hand out some cards. I wanna just tell us a quick testimony of a woman in our church a year ago when Pastor Mark handed out these cards for the one and they've got ability to write five names on them. Actually, if the host team wanna come now, they can do that and hand out these cards. In the seat pockets in front of you, there's pens as well. And this woman came to me and said, hey, Chad and I, um, I don't know, I was really bold about this thing and I, I wrote five names down that God put on my heart um, that He wouldn't want someone else to reach, like He's called me to reach. You know, they're in my world, they're my friendship group. And she calls me and says, um, so it's been one week and of the five names that I wrote, I kind of thought maybe this would be like a year thing or a two year thing, believing for the salvation of these five. Um, so two I text and they, they came to church on the very next Sunday, which I never thought would come to church. The third one, I walked into gym on the Monday and bumped into them at a gym I didn't know they literally attended. The fourth one called me and we haven't spoken in years. Four out of five within a moment of her writing physical names and applying faith and prayer to what God wants to do. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit's at work through this girl. But you know what I think it is? It's not some magic potion of a card and a pen. It's attaching your faith to the heart of the Father for His kids. It's awakening, not Jesus. He's awa- It's awakening you and I like, flip, hold on a sec. I've got a card right here called For The One. God, who are five ones that are probably in my world? Let me tell you another story. Three weeks ago, and a great family in our church came to me. I got off stage and said, hey, those two Hindu, Hindus we brought to church tonight. So it's awesome. How, how do you know them? Like, to be honest, we don't know them that well. They work at 7-Eleven and we felt a prompting. We come here all the time. We should just invite them to church. And in worship, there they are being touched by the presence of the God, the true God, um, with their heart and hands open. And do you know, do you know, what, do you know what I'm saying? It's, it's not that the Holy Spirit wasn't ready for these moments of this girl, and this family, it's that we the church, we the body, we the remnant of Jesus Christ become awakened to this. People literally a question or an invitation away that would say, if only someone would invite me, because can I urge you tonight? They're waiting for an answer. They're longing for you to be bold in your faith and step out and actually invite them to church because whether they know it or not, they are searching. Whether they appear like they're searching or not, let me tell you, they are searching for an answer.